Uh, well, Janet, Dr. Eckerson, I appreciate your being here. Um, My pleasure. It's a chance to talk about your dissertation, uh, which, as you know and hopefully are proud of, uh, was recognized by the uh, Carnegie Program for the Education Doctorate National, so CPED National uh, recognized it as one of two dissert dissertations in 2016 uh, worth highlighting. And I actually want to take, um, take advantage of the opportunity to ask you a little bit about it. Um, I've read it, you've read it, you wrote it. Uh, but for an audience that is, is unfamiliar with it, I know that the title was Teacher Perspectives on Professional Development Needs for Better Serving Nebraska's Spanish Heritage Language Learners. Uh, so your work looked at heritage language learners of Spanish and related to the training and learning needs of teachers to best serve HLLs. Uh, who are HLLs or what are HLLs? So heritage learners of Spanish are, um, you know, there's a lot of different definitions in the literature that take into account a lot of different factors. But for pedagogical purposes, we think of a heritage language learner as a student who was raised in a home where a minority language is spoken, um, but then is schooled primarily in the dominant language, English, and is to some degree bilingual in both of those two languages. And so in a Spanish language classroom, a heritage language learner um, would be a student who had learned to speak Spanish at home and may have a varying degree of literacy skills in Spanish because they received the majority of their education uh, in English in the public schools in the United States and so would therefore have different learning needs and different language proficiencies than students who are studying Spanish as a foreign language. And so and to clarify have different learning needs or different learning profile in a Spanish as a foreign language classroom. Absolutely. Right. right. And so I, I should have started by saying, and you're a Spanish teacher. Right. Uh, or a world language educator. Yes. Okay. Uh, and so, so what does a teacher who is working with heritage language learners need to be able to do? What are the, uh, according to the research that you laboriously went through, um, what are the particular sort of, uh, I don't know, challenges or at least profile differences that make an HLL different in terms of what a teacher is supposed to do? Um, well, I think, I mean, there's a lot of different, this is really sort of a, a, a nascent field. There's not a lot of research and there's not an established uh, list of teacher competencies. And that's sort of one of the things that's revealed in the literature is that we're not entirely sure um, all the ways in which heritage language learners are different than native speakers or different than second language learners. And we're not entirely sure what teachers need to know and be able to do to work with those students because we're not entirely sure what, the, what appropriate instructions for those students are. But there are some, some key areas. Um, obviously, we want teachers to understand the differences between the language acquisitions patterns and then the resulting competencies that those students bring. We want them to understand the different or sociolinguistic factors that might play into student motivation, affect, attitude related to their language that has pedagogical implications um, for how they will be as learners in the classroom. Also, some understandings about what may be some of the goals of instruction of of heritage language um, might be as opposed to goals of foreign language uh, instruction, including things like language maintenance for transmission to future generations, acquisition of um, standard or academic registers of the language, um, and, and developing language in a way that might be useful to the student, not just personally, but then professionally in the future. Um, but the, the field um, isn't, in, isn't in agreement yet about what the most appropriate models of instruction are, whether we should be looking more to language arts models, if we should be looking to um, content-based language instruction the way we do with ELL students, um, or if we're looking at some of the comprehensible input models that are um, becoming more popular in second language uh, second language instruction. So there's, um, the conversation is happening, but it's by no means decided. Okay. Uh, I know that you came to the University of Nebraska's CPED program in 2011, um, and, and then graduated in 2015, uh, if I'm doing, if I'm remembering right. dates correctly. And when you came to CPED in 2011, uh, one, you had already been a classroom teacher for six or seven years at mm -hmm. that point, uh, teaching. Uh, Spanish as a world language, and so presumably, uh, and the district that you were in was roughly 50% Latino and Latina enrollment, roughly 50% Anglo, uh, and so you certainly had heritage language learners in your enrollment. One of the uh, turns of phrase that CPED likes to use is uh, problems of practice that people enroll in EDD programs, education doctorate programs, because there is something about what they're currently doing 
that is intriguing, is vexing, is interesting, and they want to sort of figure it out better, uh, presumably to be able to change their own practice and uh, in terms of documenting in a dissertation, position others to change their practice as well. How would you characterize your problem of practice uh, that ultimately framed why you did the dissertation that you did? Right. Um, so I think for me, um, so I was um, teaching Spanish classes to Spanish speakers, so Spanish uh, as a heritage language courses. Um, even from my first year of teaching, I taught in Florida and then um, in Crete, Nebraska. And I, as I was, as, as I taught those courses, um, I I felt that I um, I didn't have anyone to talk to. This is this is in the most basic sense the problem of practice is that I was not prepared by my pre-service teacher preparation program to teach classes. Um, for Spanish speakers. Um, I was not prepared to um, design or develop curriculum to do that. And when I went looking for um, materials, and whether they be commercially developed materials, um, or whether they be um, resources, or even online communities of practice where I might go to for expertise for people who had drawn conclusions about how to do this, or, or what was best practice, I, I, couldn't find, um, I couldn't find enough. And what I did find seemed wanting, given my my context. There didn't seem to there didn't seem to be resources. There didn't seem to be a community, um, and I had no way I felt to know from any external source um, if what I was doing was the right thing. If the kind of instruction that I was um, giving students was the right thing, and so. In a really fundamental sense, I was looking for a community of practice. I was looking for other practitioners in similar contexts um, doing the kind of work I was doing to say, hey, are you doing the same thing that I'm doing? Are you having the same experiences that I'm having? Um, and so it's from that desire for a community that the dissertation eventually developed. Um, and I started um, just by reaching out to other teachers who I knew were doing the same thing that I was, and I tried to put together a sort of informal teacher conversation group where we could do what I was hoping to do, which was saying, what are you doing, um, you know, sharing resources. And what I discovered in doing that is that bringing together these, uh, you know, inviting this half a dozen teachers from across the state to meet, that the, the demands in terms of time, in, to, in you know, geographic location, that it's hard for people to get together to do something that is essentially voluntary as much as we want to do it. So of course we found we had things in common, we had things we wanted to talk about, but driving, you know, two hours to meet once a month um, for an essentially unremunerated and unrecognized professional development activity wasn't a realistic response to that, to that need. And that's where um, essentially the, the, the idea for the dissertation as it came to to take shape came from. So I said, well, if that's not, um, if that's not going to work, this informal conversation group, um, what would? And what would work is something that is going to be recognized and remunerated by, by some kind of external entity. And I thought, in order for whether that be a professional network like the Nebraska International Language Association, whether that be an educational service unit, the Department of Education, that if um, we're going to ask those external entities to help us create this, this community of practice. We're going to need some systematic data about the demand for such professional development, the nature for such professional development, and out of that emerged the decision to conduct a statewide survey um, and some interviews so that I could then adequately characterize the, the potential audience and what would be the, the topics of professional development related to heritage language learners that really are relevant not just to, to me, but to the wider community of Nebraska Spanish teachers. Okay, so uh, in essence, your, your dissertation or your problem of practice had three phases. One was uh, discomfort as a practitioner. Uh, you knew you had students in your enrollment, students who spoke Spanish as a first language, and yet you were sort of teaching them Spanish because they'd never studied it academically, and you were knowing they had a different profile than other learners in your classroom, but what to do, knowing they were different, didn't necessarily mean that you knew what to do going forward after acknowledging their difference. So then, uh, step two, you sort of found a community of other Spanish teachers and other Nebraska communities, and it's perhaps worth as an aside here, pointing out that particularly related to meatpacking in eastern Nebraska, um, this is part of the new Latino diaspora, uh, there are a number of places, uh, Crete where you were being one, uh, Grand Island being another, Madison, Nebraska being a third, um, Lexington, Nebraska being a fourth. There are a number of communities that have substantial, relatively newly arrived 
uh, Latino populations, many of uh, whom are Spanish-speaking households at mm -hmm. home. So step two of your problem of practice, you found a number of other teachers who were describing to you, yes, I too have a blend of profiles of learners, I too wish I knew more what to do, and everybody agreed that you were onto something, and then everybody also agreed that if you weren't uh, going to be paid for professional development related as to what to do, it was, in a sense, too much. You know, so yes, we agree this matters, but no, it's not viable to, to continue to meet informally monthly um, ad infinitum. So then the third step was to figure out what would, more, what would a more formal training in-service infrastructure that included professional recognition, that included professional compensation, look like that turned existing, uh, in this case, Spanish teachers, but presumably heritage language teachers, it could be any heritage language, uh, but could turn um, existing world language educators into uh, more nuanced, more broadly capacious, more, more skilled uh, world language educators taking note of HLLs and non-HLLs as jointly part of their enrollment. So the third step, that's where you were starting to talk about uh, surveys, um, looking at a, basically statewide at all Spanish teachers, how frequent is this as an issue, right? Um, and then much more substantively, what do you need to know, correct? Right, um, so when it, when it came time to, uh, pro to propose an, a, an actual study, um, so I had, a, had piloted this informal group as a potential source of a, of a dissertation topic. Um, but when that became sort of not viable, um, we looked at what would it take to, to do something that would have, that would be recognized by an external entity. And so then, um, I essentially, in, in looking for a study design, um, decided that design research really was, um, educational design research was really what I was trying to do. Um, so if educational design research then is sort of the iterative attempt to create an intervention in context. Um, so looking at that design research process, you started with a need to characterize the need. Um, what is the need for professional development as it relates to heritage language learners in Nebraska? And so to do that, I, I conducted a statewide survey, not of all Spanish teachers in Nebraska, but a targeted survey of Spanish teachers in Nebraska working in communities where there is a significant Latino population. Um, because if we're characterizing the needs of that group, it's really a specific group. It's these communities where there are significant Latino populations. And from that survey, um, we're able to, I, I was able to sort of characterize teachers, um, not just teachers described professional development needs, but also what did they know about heritage, heritage language learners where had they learned that, um, and, and about their own desires and wishes for professional development. Not just what would they like to learn about, um, but also how they would like to learn about it. So those design pieces that can inform the creation later of a prototype. Mm -hmm. um, from, that, from that survey, I then identified a few subgroups um, of practitioners. So really teachers who were like me teaching courses that were specifically de designed for heritage language learners. Um, then you had teachers who were working with students in mixed contexts where they have classrooms that are part um, second language learners, part heritage language learners. And then a third group of teachers um, who really reported um, not doing anything differently for the heritage language learners in their, their classrooms but expressing an, an interest um, or a desire to learn more. And so from those three sort of subgroups in the literature, I conducted three um, semi-structured interviews with three um, people representing those subgroups. And so, so nine people total, nine three total. in each group? Yeah, three in each of those identified okay. subgroups from the survey. And then I was able to use that interview data um, to inform a little bit the, the survey data to have better characterization of what maybe some of these survey, survey responses might mean. And, and taken together all of that data, um, describes in some sense what some of the challenges and opportunities for providing professional development for these teachers are. And, and some things emerged from that, um, one of them being that really uh, the need statewide, while it might be for some teachers, um, information about developing curriculum for heritage language specific courses, really the wider need was need for differentiation strategies in order to, to better serve students in those mixed courses. We find that those mixed courses were far more common um, and that teachers were acknowledging and actually had a quite, 
quite a bit of knowledge derived from their own practice about what makes a heritage language learner different from a second language learner, that through their work with students have identified many of the same things that the academic literature um, you know, and through studies of language acquisition have identified, that they saw that in their practice, but weren't and had an idea also, maybe a, a motivation to do something different for those students, but weren't sure what to do. Mm -hmm. And so in, in from that sort of need that emerged from the study, um, we looked at what would be a professional development experience that might help those student, help those teachers feel empowered to differentiate in those classes and to know what kind of differentiation to do. So the last piece of the, of the study, so besides collecting that data and um, characterizing essentially the audience and the needs of that audience. Um, I then, in collaboration with the um, with Department of Education, the ESU, and the Nebraska Association of the Teachers of Spanish and Portuguese, developed a prototype worksheet workshop that we then delivered um, to a group of of teachers at one of the educational service units that, um, in, in some ways, responded to what practitioners said about what they wanted the format of professional learning to look like. Um, which was teacher-led um, or led by peers in, in small groups with opportunities to, to talk to colleagues and in person as opposed to delivered online. online. And so that prototype workshop um, as, as a kind of final product in the, in the dissertation and as an enactment phase of the design study sort of provided an example space of what, what professional learning might look like in this particular context for these particular educators responding to the needs that they themselves articulated. So uh, the, when you say Department of Education, that's the Nebraska Department of Education. Uh, when you said ESU, that's the Education Service Unit, which are these sort of intermediaries mm -hmm. between the state and local school districts. Um, and as you point out, you know, there's this desire for in-service, there's this desire for teacher-led in-service, there's a sort of proof of principle. And you highlighted, I think, uh, somewhat appropriately, that you know, Nebraska is a particular context. But presumably, Nebraska isn't the only place where there are heritage language learners. You, you made a brief allusion to the fact when you were a teacher in Florida at the beginning of your career, there were heritage language learners in your enrollment. Um, how do you see what you learned from Nebraska as prospectively being relevant in Iowa, in Kansas, or even further afield in North Carolina or Texas? Or you know, I, I, There's Nebraska angles to this for sure, but what part of this is bigger than just us in here? Right, um, so some of the teacher articulated needs, which in, in many ways confirmed the thoughts I had in my own practice. Um, so many of the teacher articulated needs in this survey and interview um, and, and what were revealed as teacher beliefs and teacher competencies. So there's some things as far as implications for preparing teachers to work with heritage language learners that are relevant across contexts, which are things like, um, you know, teachers might be very good as language educators as distinguishing the difference between the competencies that heritage language learners have and that second language learners have. They're very good at observing the language and understanding those differences, though they may need help and that are, are not so obvious the differences between the, socio, the sociolinguistic characteristics about motivation and affect that may not be as readily apparent to, to teachers. So teacher preparation programs should take that into account. Also, there's a lot of teacher anxiety about language proficiency as it relates to teaching heritage language learners, so teachers who express that their language proficiency may not be adequate, or a lot of questions, and I think that there's room um, in the dialogue to have some, some frank and critical conversations about what level of cultural competence or what level of language proficiency is necessary to teach heritage language learners, particularly in heritage language specific courses. Um, and there was also tremendous demand from teachers for models of curriculum um, models of instructional practice which are really absent out there. So examples of instructional units that are intended for use with heritage language learners that don't look like language arts curriculum and that don't look like um, foreign language curriculum. And so really that's, that's a need that exists across the field and not just, um, not just in Nebraska. And I think really there's a lot of context outside the American Southwest and perhaps some of the urban centers on the East Coast and Florida where the teachers who are working with heritage language learners are not necessarily working in existing communities. They're not a part of, um, of a community within their district um, where there's a curriculum specialist, where the materials are provided to them. Most teachers across the Midwest and perhaps the American South working with heritage language learners are doing so in relative isolation. 
And so that need for bringing together teachers that may not work in the same district or may not even work in close geographic proximity is a need that exists throughout the country. And I think this model um, of the partnership between the teacher professional organization, the Nebraska Association of Teachers of Spanish and Portuguese, along with the ESU and the Department of Education is one model by which we can reach teachers that are working in those marginal contexts that don't have access to colleagues. And so I think there's some utility there in this study as an example of that kind of professional learning experience. I have just two last questions. Um, one is sort of further understanding the challenge or task of uh, teachers of heritage language learners. I've been told that there in some senses are multiple Spanishes. So Mexican Spanish, Argentinian Spanish, Iberian Spain Spanish might be different from each other. And if you have a teacher who as a junior in college and a pre-service orientation got to spend a semester in Spain, they may have gained a vocabulary, Spanish competence for sure, that is different from a Mexican newcomer who is from the state of Nayarit in their classroom. And there is this disconnect or this discomfort where a child is using Spanish that a Spanish teacher is unfamiliar with, a Spanish teacher is using Spanish that the child is unfamiliar with, and they're talking past each other, and then the teacher has the power, perhaps, to say, well, you know, my language is right and your language is wrong, and that gets, I think, into some of these sort of motivational, sort of emotional sort of dimensions uh, to the learner. Correct me if I, if I have this wrong mm -hmm. or partly wrong but it makes sense that if a child has thought of themselves as a Spanish speaker and they're now taking Spanish as a foreign language and they're not doing well at it, there's all kinds of identity work going on for that kid that's very different than a kid who's taking Spanish as a foreign language. Is that true? Absolutely, and that's, I guess, what um, I mean when I say there's really a need to perhaps explicitly address with teachers that they are perhaps less likely or was apparent in the survey that teachers just through their work with heritage language learners are not necessarily going to develop the kind of awareness of some of these issues that, um, that certainly are being brought up in the literature and that certainly um, we understand are factors that affect the educational outcome of those students. So that identity work, the motivation, um, and, and the issue, there's kind of two issues there, right? And the issue of register um, and, and how we approach error correction with heritage language learners as being different than we perhaps mm -hmm. replace approach that error correction with second language learners. And I think those are some of the things that teachers are less likely to come to their, to come to that conclusion on just through their work in their classroom. Um, unlike the way that they're, they're, they come to the awareness that they have, there are orthographic spelling issues for heritage language learners that are not issues mm -hmm. for native speakers or that are not issues for second language learners. Mm -hmm. Teachers come to those recognitions yeah. on their own in their work with students, but they don't necessarily come to the same conclusions about motivation, affect, identity that, that we're seeing in the literature. Okay, as I promised last question, and I appreciate your patience through this whole interview process. Um, your dissertation was recognized uh, nationally. It was an award, presumably that was um, very affirming. But as you reflect on it, it's now a year since you sort of put your pen down, passed it in, done. Uh, presumably relieved it to be done. Um, what, as you remember your dissertation, are you most proud of? What do you think are the, you know, the pieces that uh, 14 months later you look back at and you're like, huh, I was onto something. I, I, I've written a dissertation. I know there's parts that we look back and we're like, oh no. But what are the parts you're proud of? Um, I think the thing I'm, I'm most proud about in the dissertation was, was one, the decision to, to, to use the design, the educational design research framework um, to construct the study. Because from the very beginning, I was very concerned about producing something that actually, um, that, was, that was action, um, and not just the examination of a context. I would not have been satisfied with the dissertation if I had simply stopped after collecting the survey and interview data. To me, I'm very proud of, and, I, and to me the most important part of the dissertation is the prototype um, professional development worksheet that we developed in response to that survey data. So I feel like the utility of educational research is in the actions that impact practice. And so taking what I, what I learned um, you know, from what practitioners told me and then creating a product that we could use to further the, the knowledge of Nebraska Spanish teachers about heritage language learners in a way that was responding to the needs that they themselves articulated, that's what I'm the most proud of is the, um, the piece of action actually impacting not just my practice but the practice of my colleagues throughout the state is something that I would absolutely do again and that I'm very proud of. And I also think that there was a really um, 
fruitful model of that collaboration between the Nebraska Association of Teachers of Spanish and Portuguese and the ESU that is um, in that, that step of creating that relationship and that offer to, um, to, to offer that worksheet, workshop as a partnership is something that um, we're continuing to do now in Nebraska through some of the teacher professional development organizations and I'm really proud of the impact of the study on continued practice in Nebraska. So you're a doctor now, but the work is ongoing? Right. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you.